Hey everyone, we're going to go through the torque pogle here. At my most recent training, I learned that um, high school students typically can only stay focused on a lecture or video or something like that for nine minutes at a time. And I know we've had some like 40 minute videos and this one might be um, close to that length too. So what I'm going to do is every time we've done about nine minutes worth, I'm going to pause and ask you guys to pause the video and you know, walk around for a couple of minutes, get the blood flowing, and then you can sit back down at your computer or phone or whatever and fit, continue watching the video for another nine minutes. But let's try to to keep it in, you know, nine minute chunks. So that way we stay focused and, and make sure we're able to learn everything we need to learn here about torque. So I'm not going to spend too much of your time reading all of this because you guys are all very capable readers, but essentially torque is the rotational version of force. So what I mean by that is um, you have some sort of fixed pivot point. Uh, I think a door is a great example. So the door hinge right here is attached to the wall. It, it can't move anywhere and the door rotates around that point in a circular fashion. And obviously the door doesn't go all the way around in a circle like that because there's like a wall, but but it moves in a circular way. It's not moving its position. It's, it's attached in place. It's spinning. So torque is a spinning version of force. Um, that's what uh, we're dealing with here. So some some ways we use force in our life is uh, a door, like I just said, um, turning on a faucet, um, a wrench, or um, turning your wheel, the steering wheel in a car, for example. Um, anytime you've got something spinning with an attached pivot point, uh, there's some torque. Um, a basketball player who has its pivot foot, uh, you know, firmly on the ground and is spinning around it, that could be um, measured in a torque. So anytime um, something is attached at one point and kind of doing a circular type of motion around it, that's a torque, creating that circular version of force. Um, if we had time, if, if, if you get an opportunity to take physics too, we would spend a whole unit on circles and circular motion and how, and you would see that every thing we've learned about um, position, velocity, acceleration, force, uh, it all has a circular um, counterpart to it. So, um, we so far we've been working with linear, so like x and y as our directions. Right, so in a in a linear format, which means you know things working in lines instead of circles, we have our x direction, we have our y direction, and for circles, you know circles don't actually move in the x or y direction because they are kind of fixed in place and they just keep going around and around in circles. So you can go in the counterclockwise direction like that, or the other way in the clockwise direction. And we'll talk more about directions later. But essentially that's the primary difference here. So it is a force. The units get a little funky and we'll get to that later as well. But, but torque is definitely a force. It's a force that causes a spin rather than an actual like position change. Um, so mathematically, torque is equal to the perpendicular force times the lever arm length or the radius and you can see that if you if you imagine the door here and we'll pretend there's no wall so the door is free to spin about the full circle like that then this the length of the door right here let's use a different color let's go with uh, blue the length of the door here, if I could draw a straight line, would be the radius. And that radius is actually a vector. 
right? Because it starts it starts here in the in the fixed point, the pivot point, and it moves out the length of the door. So that is a vector in this case. I, I should have used my vector symbols on these because we know force is a vector. Um, the radius is also a vector in this case. And so this uses something called the cross product which is the opposite of the dot product. So the dot product from, from work, if you remember, so let's say we have this force vector here, and this was our displacement vector from work, and we had this angle in between. The dot product from work figures out how, how similar these two vectors are. How much are they going in the same direction, right? How much are they both going this way? The cross product for torque is the opposite. The cross product uses the opposite direction. So it wants to figure out how, how much are these two forces in the opposite direction. So how much is this, is this one in the x compared to how much is this one in the y? And so because of that, like for example, if this was our force vector and this was our, that was really poorly drawn. Let me try that one more time. And this was our radius vector, the dot product would be very high because they're going in the exact same direction. However, the cross product, this one right here, the cross product would be zero because they're entirely in the same direction. There, there's um, no y component at all. Both of those vectors are entirely x. Now, if, if the vectors look like this, say this was our radius and this was our force, the dot product of those two vectors would be zero because they are not in the same direction at all. However, the cross product, this one here that we're talking about today, the cross product would be at its maximum because they're entirely in separate directions. One is entirely x, the other is entirely y, and um, therefore the cross product is maximized. So the cross product is like the opposite of the dot product. It figures out how much are two vectors not aligned. The dot product from work tells you how much are two vectors aligned. So, um, Vectors have multiple ways of multiplying, and we've learned two of them here this week, the dot product and the cross product. One last thing I want to point out is the units. Technically, you have a force times a distance, right? That You've got a, a force times some sort of distance, so you'll get newtons times meters, um, newton meters. Now, you may remember from energy that a newton meter is also equal to a joule, but that is that's a mathematical coincidence. That's um, right here, coincidence. That's it would not be accurate to think of a newton meter in the torque sense as an energy measurement. That's just a mathematical coincidence that they both happen to be some sort of force times distance unit, but torque is definitely a force type measurement, not a energy measurement. So it's a force. You want to think of it as a force, just a force that goes in circles instead of a regular arrow vector that we're used to. And then um, so looking at question number two here, uh, everything, the torque is largest when both things involved are largest. So a bigger force gives you a bigger torque. I think that's kind of obvious, right? If you push harder on a door, the door will open faster. Pretty straightforward. Um, also, the, the longer the lever arm, right? So, you know, that's why we have things like wrenches is because if we tried to, you know, to spin that bolt right here with our fingers, <laughs> that would be very hard to do. But adding the wrench to the situation increases the length of our lever arm increases our radius there and therefore we're able to apply more torque with that same amount of force. So large force, long lever arm, 
and it's been a little over nine minutes now so I please pause the video before we go to the next slide walk around for a minute give yourself a quick brain break and we'll move on to the next slide great so now we're back um, I hope you did take a little break there if not please pause the video take yourself a, a little break eat eat breakfast or you know just walk around your house for a moment and then uh, let's get back to it so so far we've learned pretty much the basic that if you take the force cross product the radius these are both vectors that that's the basic formula for torque which has the Greek letter tau kind of like a curvy T basically so let's look at these first two conceptual questions right if the force gets bigger just like we just said torque also gets bigger same thing with the radius the lever arm if the radius gets bigger torque gets bigger so directly proportional is what we call that so we could turn this bolt here by using a large force with a small lever arm or if we we could apply that same amount of torque by using a small force with a large large lever arm and i'm just going to put large r because i don't feel like writing lever arm with my mouse but basically if you can increase that radius increase the size of the circle you can apply the same amount of torque with without applying a huge the, the same amount of force so wrenches are helpful for tightening bolts because they extend the circle they increase the radius so instead of a radius of like you know a centimeter here instead we now have the radius of like you know a foot or whatever and so engineer Bob over here is struggling because he's holding the wrench halfway down he's he's cutting his circle in half basically and that's not super helpful so he would want to put his hand down here to to get that full length of the lever arm get that full usefulness out of the wrench and then it would be much easier for him to turn that bolt so engineer Bob would want to move his hand down to get a larger R when you get a larger R you get a larger torque so that's that's engineers Bob's problem right there is he's not holding the wrench in the ideal spot um, I think that was pretty straightforward so let's continue moving through this pogo so I really like this problem because you know it's my, my own personal history I showed up for my interview and had a pretty good interview and then right at the end of the interview Mr. Etzel was like all right quick little sample teach here I, I had no time to prepare really I had to completely improv and um, kind of make it up as I go and I, uh, I I nailed it you know obviously I got the job so I'm pretty proud of myself and and I can share that experience with you so what I what I had them do is I used the door right I looked around the room and I was like what in this room has torque and and Mr. Etzel didn't actually use the word torque he wanted me to give a lesson on fulcrums but I'll explain what a fulcrum is here in a, a couple slides but but basically it it very much goes with torque and so I used the door that was what I saw in the room that I could that had a fulcrum that I could use and um, I essentially did this little mini lesson where I asked them to push on the door at these three locations and reflect on which one was easiest to open the door and which one was hardest to open the door and um, hopefully you did that at your house as well you know obviously the door handle is over here on the far side so it makes sense logically that if you push the door furthest away from the hinge that it would be easiest to open and, and I assume that's what you noticed as well that pushing the door over here on the side of the door that it's attached I mean doors are pretty easy to open usually so it's you, you were probably successful but it's definitely easier to open the door when you push on the other side the side that's not attached 
So describe what you experienced there. Basically, what I experienced is that um, it required less force in picture three to apply the same amount of torque because the lever arm is longer, the radius is longer. Remember, le lever arm, um, lever arm here just means radius, pretty much. So, when in picture number three, the radius was the biggest, and hence the torque was um, larger and required a less lesser force. So, that's that mini lesson there. So this is where it starts to get a little more complicated, but not too much, not too bad. So you may remember we talked about the cross product and the cross product is looking for two vectors that, you know, are entirely in different directions. So we like, for example, these two vectors I just drew here are at a right angle. And that's what we, when we show a square like that in a corner, it, it says it's at a right angle. So perfect 90 degree angle, we call that perpendicular in math, right? Um, little math terminology right there, perpendicular. So these two angles up here, these two vectors, I should say, not angles, these two vectors up here would have the maximum cross product because they are perpendicular entirely in different directions. Um, However, that's not always the case, right? So far, that's been the case in our examples, like opening a door and stuff. All of those are perpendicular forces, right? The door, here's your door with the door handle on it. And then when you open the door, you pull the handle, and that's a 90 degree angle. So that's a perpendicular force. Um, however, that's not always the case, right? Like this this person here is not using their wrench very well and they're kind of applying a side force to it. It's not perfectly perpendicular. It's at an angle. Um, so when it's not perpendicular, when it's at an angle, like like this here, when, when, when there's an angle involved, it's not a perfect 90 degree angle, right? Usually we want that perfect 90 degree angle to maximize our torque. But if we don't have that, then it reduces torque. So when we're off to a side angle, like, like this situation here, that reduces our torque. And then to increase our torque, you can do just like this here, make sure you're at that straight on 90 degree angle, perpendicular, and then you can get even more tor torque by increasing your, your radius as well. So because we want the opposite, right? So in the dot product, we used cosine because we wanted the adjacent side of that vector. We wanted the vector going the same way. This time we want the vector going the opposite way. So we go opposite in SOHCAHTOA and that's sine. There are some extremely weird circumstances where it would be cosine, but never in this class. Even if we had the whole two weeks to teach you torque that I usually have, we would not ever have a situation where cosine would be it. So sine is what you wanna to use to find that perpendicular angle. And I'll go over that here in just a moment on the next slide and show you that equation. Um, but basically you um, take your force, and it doesn't have to be perpendicular, just whatever your force vector is, cross product, right? We're doing the cross product now, radius. And so because it's sine, that means you take your force times your radius times the sine of the angle. And the sine of 90 degrees is one, a perfect one. So that's why when you have that perfect 90 degree angle, you don't need to worry about the sine, it's just force times radius because sine of 90 degrees is one. However, if it's not 90 degrees, then, then the sine will be less than one and you're going to need to um, incorporate that into your equation. So just like it says, that answers this question here, if the angle is increased from 20 to 45, 
then torque is going to increase because we got closer to that perfect 90 degree angle. The closer your angle is to 90, the more torque you'll be. 90 degrees, just like, just like these two examples right here, 90 degrees is the maximum torque. So the closer your angle is to 90, the higher your torque will be. And I notice we're at about 20 minutes here in this video, so please pause it and take another quick mental break play a video game for a couple minutes, walk around, eat, um, but take a break for a couple minutes and come back and we'll continue into the mathematics portion. Welcome back, I hope you had a nice break. Um, so it's time for the mathematics portion. And at first off, I wanna point out that equation up here that we, same equation we just had from the last slide. So. How did we get there? First, we started with torque. We know that torque is equal to the perpendicular force. That's what this little symbol means, is perpendicular, because you can see it, it's like a 90 degree angle symbol. So the perpendicular force uh, times the radius, or cross radius, cross product. To find the perpendicular force, you need to take the force times the sine of the angle. If it, um, so if that, angle is 90 degrees, you get that perfectly perpendicular force. If it's not 90 degrees, then you will reduce that total force by some amount in order to get the perpendicular force. So combining those two equations into one big equation here, you get that the torque is equal to the force times the sine of the angle times the length of the radius. So basic practice problem here is right here. So this first one, you would take your 90, your 90 Newtons is your force, times sine of 90 degrees, which remember is one. When you have 90 degree angle, you have that maximized force. So sine of 90, which is one, times the radius, which it tells us is 2.4 meters in this case. So we multiply all that together. 4 times 9 is 36. 36 plus 180, it would be 216. 216 Newton meters. Wow, my mouse drawing is not particularly good today. I apologize. But 216 Newton meters, I believe. Okay, I don't trust my mental math today, so I'm gonna punch that into the calculator to confirm. Okay, I got it right. So 216, so you, it's a simple plug and chug when it comes to the math. However, much like linear forces, um, the physics of it can get quite complicated. Um, however, since I don't have time to teach you the complicated versions, um, for this class, you know, there will be one torque problem on the final, pretty much that's it. Maybe there might be a, like a multiple choice conceptual question, but you only have to calculate torque once and it'll be just like that, where you just take the equation, you plug in the numbers, multiply, boom, there you go. I'm not gonna give you anything harder than that. So you're already ready for the final, um, but but let's keep learning anyway and and make sure we're ready for college, which really is the goal here. So we've got, again, same thing in problem two, just different numbers, 85 Newtons, 23 centimeters. So we gotta do some unit conversions, centimeters, not what we want. And we've got an angle, how much torque do we have? So then, you know, plug it into the equation, 85 times 0 0.23 meters. So I converted centimeters to meters there by dividing by 100. And then multiply all of that times sine of 84. And I do not know the sine of 84 off the top of my head. It's very close to one, right? Because 84 degrees is kind of, is close to 90. Um, so let's see, sine of 84 degrees times 0.23 times 85, and you get 19.4. 19.4 Newton meters. And 
and that is torque there. So here's where it can get slightly more complicated. So I'm going to draw what I call a torque free body diagram here. I wish I could like use shapes and stuff. Like, all right, so there's a pivot point and a rate. Holy cow, this is, I apologize. Uh, good enough, good enough. So there's our lever arm with the fixed point right here. So the first engineer is pulling on the switch with a force of 200 newtons at a distance of 0.4 meters. So this first one here is at, is at 200 newtons. And it's at 0 0.4 meters. And the second one, oh, and at 90 degrees, perfect 90 degree angle. The second one has a force of 250 at a distance of 0.6. However, it's at an angle of 75 degrees. And I'm not going to write everything because I don't want to waste your time with my mouse here. But it's at 0 0.6 meters at 250 newtons, but this one's at an angle of 75 degrees. So I call this my torque free body diagram here. It's just a nice little image, nice, nice little diagram here that has all my information I need. It shows me all of the torques involved on this rusty switch. So the two, there are two torques involved in this rusty, rusty switch. And just like with net force, you can find a net torque by adding all of the torques together. So you're going to want to add those two torques together, right? So total torque, net torque, torque net equals the first, the first torque, which will just be 200 times 0 0.4 times sine of 90, but that's just one. Remember, if, the, if your angle is 90, you don't really need to include the sine portion because it's just one. So there's torque number one. Torque number two, 250 newtons times 0.6 meters times the sine of 75 degrees. And again, make sure you're calculating in degrees and not radians. Okay, let's see what we get here. Equals about 225 slightly less than 225. I'm going to round it up. So 225 total Newton meters on this rusty switch from the, from the two torques added. So this torque was 80. This torque was approximately 145 and we add them together. Now note, they're both going the same direction in this case. Both of these engineers, both of these torques are attempting to spin the switch this way. The brother and sister problem is not the case, right? They're classic siblings, brother and sister. You know, the, the sister wants to hide in her room and her brother wants to open the door and bug her and the sister is trying to keep the door closed. So here's our door. Dang it. One more time. Here's our door. Good enough. The door has a little kink in it, but that's okay. And the brother is attempting to open the door with a perpendicular force, 90 degree angle, at one meter and 175 newtons. The sister Sorry, I went backwards here. So that's the brother. <laughs> the sister is also at one meter. So this was this was the brother at 175 newtons. And the sister 
also pulling at a 90 degree angle is closing the door here, so this is the sister, is closing the door with a force of 180 newtons in the other direction, other direction. So how can we calculate this net torque? Well, forces are vectors, torques are forces, hence torques are vectors. However, they're not vectors in the usual straight line arrow sense. They are angled vectors. So that is more a more accurate torque vector. So instead of left and right being positive and negative, we need clockwise and counterclockwise to be positive and negative. So I'm going to go ahead and call counterclockwise positive in this problem. So counterclockwise is positive. That means the brother is attempting to pull in the positive direction. The sister then is attempting to pull in the negative direction. So what would our net torque be in this case? And I apologize, I'm going a little over our nine minute window on this slide. So as soon as we're done with this problem, we'll take our next brain break. But the net torque would be our positive torque, the brother, 175 times one meter, 175 times one, times sine of 90, but that's just one as well, minus, right, because the, the sister's torque in the negative direction, 180 times one, and that would give us a negative five negative five newton meters. So torque can be negative, but again, that just shows direction, just like in forces. Torque and force, same thing, it's just now we're spinning instead of actually moving. So negative five newton meters in that bottom one there, because the sister is winning this battle and is pulling in the negative direction. Then in this case, we said that clockwise spinning is negative, therefore, negative net torque here. So you show direction with positive and negative torque, just like you would with force. So we're a couple minutes over our nine minute window, so please pause at this time, take a minute, walk around, talk to your parents, you know, do something, and then we'll come back and continue on with our lesson. Okay, um, now that I get to this part of the Pogel, I, I kind of realized I probably should have made this an earlier part. This is kind of a very important base point of torque, uh, the pivot point, or I used this word earlier, fulcrum, because that's actually what I was asked to do at my interview was give a lesson on fulcrums, but I turned it into a little torque lesson because I think torque is very valuable learning. And obviously they agreed, they, they hired me. So the pivot point or fulcrum is that attached point that the circle is going around. So on like a seesaw, right? Seesaws kind of make a, a circle. Uh, they go through a little bit of a circle back and forth like that. And that circle is attached in the middle here. So in that case, the, the R equals zero, the radius begins in the middle. Same thing with the scissors here, right? You can have torque on the handle going back and forth, right? That's a torque. You can also have torque on the blade. That's, that's um, you know, th th those are torques. So scissors involve torque. So bolts, right, the, the, the bolt on the wrench is the pivot point. Or your knee is a pivot point for, for your leg. Um, your hip could also be a pivot point for your leg, right? So your leg has multiple pivot points. So does your arm. Your arm has multiple pivot points at the shoulder and the elbow and the wrist even, right? Your wrist and ankles can go in circle-like motions. So your body is full of pivot points and torque, and torque is a huge, huge part of the forces that act on your body. Um, your knee especially. So your knee has something called an ACL. You sports fans have probably heard that a lot, and it's never a good thing. If you're an athlete and your doctor says the letters ACL, um, it means that you are not playing your sport for many months. <laughs> um, and it's because of torque. It's because you put more torque on your knee 
than your knee could handle and it rips. Um, so you've got to be nice to your pivot points on your body because those are some of the most vulnerable spots on your body. They, they handle the torque and torque can really do some damage. So take care of your knees. And then a windmill obviously is attached in the center and goes around in a circle around it. And that's how they generate power actually is from that torque. So that torque um, turns a generator in the center here and it spins. And if we get into physics two and, and I can teach you about electricity, I can teach you why spinning things around in a circle with a magnet generates electricity, but that's basically how those windmills work is there's a big old magnet in the center with some wires around it. And when you spin a magnet inside wires, it generates electricity. And so the torque is the force that, that causes all of that to happen. The wind pushes the mill around in a circle and that torque spins a magnet, which then pushes the electrons in the wires around and causes the electricity to flow. So it's all about torque. So which part of the door is the pivot point? I'm going to test my drawing skills here. Not the worst door that's ever been drawn. Here's the handle. Here are the, what we call the door hinges, right? That, that, that attach the door to the wall. And that's the pivot point. The pivot point is the hinges where it attaches to the wall. And then you open the door in like a circle around that pivot point. So the hinges, are hinges are the door's pivot point and that's also known as a fulcrum so if you hear the term fulcrum they're talking about a pivot point where something will move around in a circle like fashion okay i'm not going to spend too much time on this slide either because it should have been earlier as well i should have moved this whole page up to page two i think because um we've already had to talk about a lot of this stuff but the directions are circular directions so if you think of a clock you know the hands on a clock go around this way and so we call that clockwise so if if a circle is going the same direction as a clock that's called clockwise if it's going the other way that's called counterclockwise and usually I will to save time especially when I'm writing with a mouse I will say CW or CCW so instead of left right and up down being our positives negatives we will say clockwise is positive or negative and counterclockwise is the other one right so for each problem we decide which one makes more sense to be positive or negative and we call one of them positive and one of them negative and we just have to make sure we keep it consistent for the whole problem so just like in the brother and sister problem when the sister was pulling with a negative torque that that's how it works we've already seen that in action we've already practiced it so net torque is just like net force you decide which ones are going positive and which ones are going negative and then you add them together it, it's it's just like that so so for this problem we're going to go ahead and say clockwise is positive so that 30 newton force is attempting to spin this disc in the positive the 20 newton force which is probably like a friction or something like that is attempting to spin the disc in the negative in the negative direction so we've got our two torques here right torque one in the positive direction torque two in the negative direction and it's hard to tell but but we're just going to assume they're at 90 degree angles um because we've got you know our radius here and then our force here and if, if I could draw it properly you would see that it is a 90 degree angle and same thing with this we've got our radius here and our force here and 90 degree angle so we don't have to worry about the sign um, so there's our two torques we've got a positive 1.2 and a negative 0.8 add those together to get a end, end result of a positive 0.4 Newton meters of torque in the clockwise direction so 
direction torque is a vector. It's just not a straight line vector. It's, it's a vector that, that's more of a, a curve, but it still has direction. In this case, the direction is represented by clockwise and counterclockwise. But mathematically, we still represent that with positive and negative. And that is almost perfect timing for our final brain break. And then we'll move into an example problem with the teeter-totter. So take a minute, take a, get a drink of water, um, you know, walk around for a moment, and then come back and we'll finish up here. Okay, welcome back to the final slide here. We've got um, a little more involved problem. It's time to take everything we've learned from this pogo and put it to action here with this teeter-totter, the seesaw. So we've got a girl of 200 newton weight and a boy of 300 newton weight on the seesaw. And the girl is three meters to the left of the fulcrum and the boy is one and a half meters to the right. And you can see that in the diagram. That, that makes a great little diagram that shows the torque involved. So how much torque is the girl applying? So first off, let's look at our angles here, right? And you can see that gravity and the lever arm, gravity is straight down. And at this moment, the lever arm is straight um, across. And so we've got that 90 degree angle. So we don't have to worry about the sign in this problem because same thing for the boy over here we've got a 90 degree angle. So the sign is just one, so we don't have to worry about the sign for this problem, but it's always good to double check. So from the girl, we've got the force of 200 newtons times the lever arm length of three meters times sine of 90 degrees, which is just one, and that'll give us 600 newton meters of torque from the girl, and the girl is going this way, and that is counterclockwise. So C, C, W. So that's the torque from the girl there. 600 Newton meters, I apologize for my bad handwriting there, but 600 Newton meters in the counterclockwise direction. The boy is same process, just different numbers. So 300 times one and a half gives us 450 Newton meters in the clockwise direction because the boy is trying to push this lever arm the other way. So the boy is going that way. So uh, let's go ahead and call clockwise positive this time. So that would turn the girl's torque into a negative 600. So calculate the strength and direction of net torque is we just add the torques together, right? So our first torque was a negative 600 Newton meters. And our second torque was a positive 450. That's, that's a plus sign, not a T. Um, sorry, my OCD doesn't like that. Plus 450. And that leaves us with a net torque of a negative 150. Newton meters, or you could say 150 Newton meters counterclockwise. So the girl is winning this battle. The boy is heavier. The boy has more force, but because of the position of the girl, the girl ha is winning this battle. So the, the seesaw would actually be going down this way and the boy side would be going up because the girl has more torque due to her increased radius. Now the boy doesn't like losing. He wants to balance the seesaw out. He wants, he wants to even out the odds. So he's going to move back here in, in this last portion in order to balance this out. So the question is, how far back does he have to move? What, what would his new position be? So his starting position was one and a half. What would his new position have to be? So to, in order for that to happen, the boy's torque and the girl's torque are going to have to be equal. Excuse me, they're going to have to be equal. So 
will set the girl's torque, which isn't changing, the girl isn't moving. So the girl's torque is still going to be equal to the 600 Newton meters it was before. The boy's torque is changing. So we would need the force of the boy times the radius of the boy. And we know the force of the boy is 300. So we can plug that in. So 600 equals 300 times, times R, right? force times radius. So 600 divided by 300 is 2. So we get that 2 meters is his, is his new R. So if he moves back to 2 meters, that, that's an ugly equal sign. So if he moves back to 2 meters, it will be balanced. So he would have to move back half a meter. He would have to move back ha another half a meter to get to 2 meters. At that point, he would balance out with the girl. So um, when something is in balance, which is usually what we want, so a lot of the times torque calculations are done to make sure that, like say a, wa a wire that's holding up a bridge, oh, say that wire can only hold like you know a million newtons or something like that, then you can do torque calculations to make sure that when you have you know cars and trucks and stuff on the bridge, that when when you um, use that million newton force from the wire is the net torque zero. Because if the net torque is not zero on a bridge, that's very bad. Because that means that the bridge is spinning and falling and breaking. So, so this is a, a, a very real world kind of problem where they use torque calculations to figure out how strong certain wires and connections need to be in order to prevent things from breaking apart. So um, I hope you found this useful and valuable. I hope this answered your questions. I hope you took a break every nine or 10 minutes like I asked to keep your brain fresh. And now you should be able to answer everything on the Pogol. Um, there was one more page, but it was extra credit. And basically I just asked you, there's a Pogol simulator on the FET website, not a Pogol simulator, I'm sorry, a torque simulator on the FET website that you can go and play around with torque a little bit for some extra credit, but I'm not going to use our video time going over extra credit. So um, it's there if you want it, not required. This video tells you how to do everything you need to do for the Pogol. So please message me if you have any questions um, and complete the exit ticket. And that's it. We've, we've learned physics for this semester. So good job, everybody. Thanks for working hard. And just let me know if you have any questions.